tough times for you now so I figured hey you know you might need some fatherly advice from who from me about what Denzel Washington plays the desperate father of the nation's number one college basketball prospect in Spike Lee's new film he got game it's one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune and I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun Times he got game is Spike Lee's strongest and most moving film since Malcolm X six years ago and it grows out of his feelings about the incredible pressures the professional sports exert on star athletes right down to the high school level. The film opens with a glorious montage over music by Aaron Copeland, a basketball being played all over the country. And then we meet Denzel Washington, a prisoner whose son is the most sought after high school player in the nation. Governor's made a request that your son, Jesus Shuttlesworth, seriously consider enrolling in his alma mater, Big State. If you persuade your son to do this, the governor has given me his word. He'll do everything in his power to cut your time here short considerably. Governor can do that. I mean, he can, he can, he can do that. So the father will try to talk him into going to Big State University. But the son, named Jesus and played by Ray Allen of the Milwaukee Bucks, is also under pressure from his girlfriend. Played by Rosario Dawson, she also wants to influence what choice he makes. DeAndre's an agent. Lala, you know I ain't supposed to be talking to no agents. You know that it's illegal. You know that. Look, all he wants to do is talk to you for five minutes and see where your head is at. My head is on my shoulders, it's gonna stay there. The son blames the father for his mother's death and for a lot of other things, including his name. Why in the hell did you name me Jesus anyway? What type of name is that? Biblical names. No kidding. It finally all comes down to one-on-one, -on -one, one -on -one. father and son facing each other on the court. I win, you sign. You win, you do what you want to do. Tear it up, whatever. I go back to Attica because I know that's what you really want, right? You want to play me one-on-one? -on -one. One on one. And if I win, you get the hell out of here? I ain't stuttered, son. The hell out of my life? Forever. You rock. He Got Game has a lot of expert inside knowledge about the way agents and the top colleges recruit star athletes. I'm sure Spike Lee has seen a lot of that at first hand. It's an angry and passionate film, but it also has a lot of heart in its theme about a father and son learning to love and accept one another. Ray Allen, who, as I mentioned, plays for the Milwaukee Bucks, is a gifted actor and needs to be because this is one sports movie that doesn't have any big game scenes or sports showdowns except for an all-important confrontation between father and son. Denzel Washington is fascinated in the way he uses silence with his son, not answering the anger and insults, but waiting and watching. This is really a good film. I thought it was very good, too, and I was taken by the father and son relationship more than any of the basketball mm -hmm. in the picture. And I know this is being talked about as, naturally, Spike Lee's basketball movie, but this is a wonderful yes, father-son story. And I think you're quite right to credit Ray Allen for an excellent performance. Mm -hmm. I mean. Who expected this? I certainly didn't. He's working with Denzel Washington, who's mm -hmm. one of our most charismatic actors, and he's right there with him every step oh, yeah. of the way. It really is. It's a good matched pair. The two of those guys just work beautifully together. You know, another thing I liked about this film, and that Spike Lee does in a lot of his films, he comes up at the end, and I won't say what it is, he comes up at the end with a wonderful image. Mm -hmm. He's able to kind of encapsulate a whole movie and a whole feeling and a whole story in one image and it comes out of nowhere and it surprises us and at the end as it delivers and we finally understand exactly what has happened it really has an emotional well, impact. Well he's a gifted image maker. Okay next movie and our next film is called The Truce and it's an emotional post holocaust drama looking at the same time period as this year's Oscar winning documentary film The Long Way Home about the days and years immediately after the liberation of the Nazi death camps and how the surviving Jews and others were tempest-tossed in displaced persons camps throughout Europe. The true stars John Turturro as the celebrated Jewish-Italian author and Auschwitz survivor Primo Levi, who wrote the book upon which the story is based. Here, he and a friend encounter a shopkeeper. We are very much Italian. 
But we come from a place where one forgets passion, family, country, culture, all. Where is that? Auschwitz. The enduring awful legacy of the Nazi death camps never stops influencing the survivors' lives, often setting one against another. You broke bread with the SS! You must have given any to end! Get out! Stay away from us! And, of course, surviving itself turned out to be a burden, too. And indeed, the author, Primo Levi, did eventually commit suicide. He spared you because he wanted you to write. To write? Write what? That. If what you say is true, that I might be alive in place of another, then writing would be an atrocious privilege. While the truce does deal with familiar material, I did find it heartbreaking and fascinating as we watched the species of man cope with the ultimate evil. The Oscar-winning documentary, The Long Way Home, is a better and more ambitious film than The Truce in that it covers the years from 1945 to 1948 and the founding of Israel. But here in The Truce, John Turturro gives a strong performance without overacting. It's hard not to follow his character and to role-play one's own reaction to experiencing such horrors. So, thumbs up for me. I think you're right, Gene, that The Long Way Home is the movie to see. Oh, and no having seen that in all of its stark detail, I found this movie to be much too picturesque mm -hmm. and episodic, and it goes for little human touches that are supposed to put an artificial narrative joy into material that shouldn't be joyful. And then right. it's very confusingly constructed. People pop up coincidentally. We don't believe that they would constantly turn up, and we don't know at times where they are or what they're doing. Uh, the entire film, it seemed to me, really lacked the kind of narrative drive and focus that it needed. Well, then let's re-emphasize the long way home is a picture for people to see. I mean, and, there's, and there's another problem I have with it, too, and that is there are four or five segments in this film where the Red Army is glorified. They're singing mm -hmm. hymns, they're marching past, and so forth. You would think Francesco Rossi, at the, Francesco Rossi at this point would be prepared to acknowledge that Stalin was a criminal too. In fact, a greater mass murderer than Hitler was. And th there's still this kind of sentiment about the, the wonderful Russians and the Soviets and so forth. The Red Army uh, and the Soviet Union were no friends to Jews either. And I don't understand what that sentiment is doing in this film. That's a fair question. Coming up later, Gwyneth Paltrow is looking for love in Sliding Doors. I kissed you. Yeah, I spotted that too. And coming up next, Robert Downey Jr. is a two-timing ladies' man in Two Girls and a Guy. Wow, whoa, surprise. So what happened with this job? Did I get it? No. Why, too talented as usual? What do you, what do you, what, what's going on? There's all these uh, blowhards working. I can't get a job. Robert Downey Jr. plays a New York actor there who has returned to his apartment unaware of a very important fact. His two girlfriends have both found out about one another, broken into his apartment, and are hiding there to confront him with his duplicity. And that's the setup for Two Girls and a Guy, written and directed by James Toback and starring Robert Downey in a role which sometimes seems like a commentary on his current problems. Not that he's a womanizer, but there's a scene where he's looking at the mirror and talking to himself in this movie that almost seems like a pep talk that he's trying to give himself to get his act together. Here's a scene where both women confront him. Wow, whoa, this is a shock. This shock, this is a surprise. Surprise. Okay, this is a massive shattering shock. His That's Heather line. Graham as the blonde and Natasha Gregson Wagner, Natalie Wood's daughter, as the fast-talking brunette, who before long is suggesting the guy might have used a little more imagination. Sometimes you underestimate people. What meaning by underestimated you? No, meaning that I might have been ready for certain things. Such as? Such as a lot of things. Such as? different things and Carla might have been ready too. For what? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know. I just want to hear you say it. Two Girls and a Guy is essentially a film stage play almost entirely shot on one set, but I don't mind that when the dialogue works and here I think it definitely does. The guy is obviously completely in the wrong, or is he? Downey is such a persuader that occasionally he has us wavering in our verdict that he's a complete louse. This is a small movie, but a smart one. And when you reflect that Downey and James Toback also made the pickup artist together 11 years ago, you wonder if it isn't a form of amends. 
Well, this is uh, an interesting companion piece and would make a good double bill yeah. with a movie <laughs> called In the Company of Men, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And placing this film in that company is uh, praise, I suppose. Because they're both about uh, obsession and male obsession. Mm -hmm. And here, I think what is being talked about is more. I just want more. I can't control it. I want it. I want it. I want it. And to see that written this well and played so well by Donnie, mm -hmm. marvelous actor, uh, is, I think, the value of this picture. If there's a criticism of the film, and I like it, it's that Toback has the women let this guy off a mm -hmm. little bit too well, easily in a way. Yeah, in other words, at the end, they're going to kind of... Well, don't get too much into that. Let's not spoil They're going to kind of something. The uh, other thing, of course, people should know, that James Toback has been gossiped about in magazines as being oh, yeah. the uh, ultimate pickup yeah. artist himself. He once had a four-page spread in Spy Magazine right. listing his activities for just one month. So yeah, with him using the same line over and over. So, you know, very clearly, this story yeah. is a, a confessional. Yes, it is. Coming up next, Gwyneth Paltrow plays a young woman for whom timing is everything and sliding doors. Gwyneth Paltrow is a young professional woman who is having a very bad day as the movie Sliding Doors begins. She is fired from work and then mugged on her way home. And since timing is everything, she wonders to her boyfriend, played by John Lynch, if the mugging would have occurred if she had caught, instead of just missed, a subway train with its sliding doors. Oh, oh, you just don't want to go wondering about things like that. You know, um, if only this and what if that. Uh, it's done now. There's another problem for her. In a parallel story, one in which she did catch the train, we see that she spots an attractive guy on the train, played by John Hanna, and he's drawn to her. One problem I had is that the two men in her alternative lives that we follow in the course of this picture needlessly look too much alike. It can confuse you. My intentions are completely honorable. I have no desire to overstep the mark. Seriously. You prefer diamonds or sapphires? Sorry. These parallel stories continue throughout the film. And in both of them, Paltrow's boyfriend is cheating on her is with an old girlfriend played by Jean Triplehorn. You can't leave her for me. Well, you haven't said you wanted that, have you? Jerry, I'm a woman. We don't say what we want, but we reserve the right to be pissed off if we don't get it. Now, Gwyneth Paltrow is an extremely appealing actress, and the story of Sliding Doors is entirely dependent on her holding our attention through a parade, actually two parades, of problems. Well, I was pretty much worn out at the end of this picture and not intrigued by the question of whether a path not taken, or in this case, a subway train not taken, can really make that much of a difference in one's life. A marginal thumbs down for me for a film that I felt was simply too emotionally repetitive. Thumbs down for me too, Gene, and I'll tell you, my test in a movie like this is, is either life oh. interesting <laughs> if it had to stand by itself? And that's the answer good. is no. Yeah, so in that case, cutting back and forth between them doesn't yeah, help. Yeah. And I just thought, I'm just looking at a gimmick, gimmick. here. That's the word that came up and, with me. And uh, there's nothing underneath it except the manipulation in the editing. It's moment. just her. I mean, the, the right. fact that we're willing to sit there in the theater is she, just a tribute to her. She's a dazzler. She's so fine in this movie that yeah. I would have liked a third timeline in which she caught a different movie. <laughs> when we come Very back, good. Victoria Foyt stars in a movie that asks if for everyone there is one true love. Deja Vu is next. <laughs> I didn't ever think that this could happen to us. Our next movie is an unabashed love story, a glorious fantasy that's all the more meaningful because it involves grown-ups instead of the post-adolescents who usually star in movie romances. Too many movies are about love at first sight between people who could use a little second sight. Deja Vu stars Victoria Foyt as a woman who gradually realizes that she's involved in a web of enchantment that spans two generations. The movie opens in Jerusalem where she meets a mysterious woman who seems to know a lot about her and gives her a precious 
piece of jewelry. It was a pair, two of them. Dress clips, you know. There's a story behind that clip, you know. Really? Yes. It was after the war when everything seemed possible again. Uh, I was very young, not yet 20. And he was an American like you. A few weeks later in England, near the White Cliffs of Dover, she meets a stranger played by Stephen Delane, and they experience the curious feeling of love at first sight. It's like clues in your body. It's like you've been collecting them your whole life. Mm. Oh, that makes me feel good. That's good. Mm. That, oh, I need to keep that. They're like memories. Mm. And then suddenly, you're in a place that you don't belong. You meet somebody and you feel everything clicks. They both meet again as house guests and the host's sister, played by Vanessa Redgrave, seems to be very wise about the eternal truth of love. Did you see him clearly? What did he look like? I remember him very dark, which may be why I've always fallen in love with dark hair. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. He was very dark, with blue eyes. Mm. He was the first person who just seemed to totally care about me. So mm. I just fell in love. I have to say I love Deja Vu, which is the best film in the long career of its director, Henry Jaglum. He wrote the movie with its star, Victoria Foyt, and it's an unapologetic love story. Flat out, no compromises, unafraid to be sentimental and heartrending and emotional. And at the same time, it has a certain wisdom about life, about the way that we have to take our chances and make hard decisions. You see a grown-up romance like this one, and it kind of pulls the rug out from under all the cornball romances involving shallow and inexperienced people. My guess is that moviegoers who like City of Angels are likely to be hit even harder by Deja Vu. And unfortunately, it won't get the wide dis distribution of City of Angels, yeah. and it won't be in the theaters, and they won't even know about it. And they'll miss a good film, and I think it's just for the reason you mentioned, which is adult. It is people who have been around, mm -hmm. who feel life as mm -hmm. they talk, mm -hmm. and you could, that they're saying something that they actually yes. know, mm -hmm. which is rare, rather than reciting words off of a script. You know, if there is still such a thing as word of mouth, though, Gene, I mean, if it's still possible for a movie to find its audience, as the full Monty did, mm -hmm. then this movie might catch on. If they just leave it in the theaters, I predict that if it does have a chance, it can yeah. gather an audience and become a phenomenon because it delivers, I think, something right. that people are hungering for. Well, they do, and this film provides it, so I hope you're right. Coming up next, our video pick of the week, a film that I thought was the single best picture of 1997, and it's just out now on home video. You're boring me. I have a husband. I don't particularly feel the need for another. Siskel and Ebert's video pick of the week is brought to you by Nestle Raisinets. At the movies or at home, Raisinets. And my video pick this week is the great film from last year called The Ice Storm. It wasn't a box office hit. Amazingly, it didn't receive a single Oscar nomination, but I can't recommend it more highly now that it's just out on home video. Indeed, I selected The Ice Storm as last year's best picture, telling the story of two married couples in 1973 Connecticut who seemingly have everything, health, intelligence, and wealth, and yet they can't get along. Kevin Klein even bores his mistress, his neighbor, played by Sigourney Weaver. I waited around for more than half an hour, nothing but my boxer shorts. And Janie. Oh, hi. Well, what's all that about? What the hell happened? A prior engagement overcame me. And neither set of parents relates well with their children. Mikey, have you heard the explosions coming from the backyard? Sir, I want children very much. I don't know. Do you know what your brother's been up to? Was because you I don't know. It's all truthful and heartbreaking in a film directed by the remarkable Ang Lee. The Ice Storm is now available on tape and will be available on Laserdisc next month. There is no excuse for you to miss it this time around. It's a profoundly sad but important film, my video pick of the week. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs up for Spike Lee's He Got Game with Denzel Washington and Ray Allen in a powerful father-son drama. It opens next week. A split vote on the truce, the Holocaust drama with John Turturro as survivor Primo Levi trying to cope with the very real terrors of surviving. I was moved by it. Roger thought it was too soft. Two thumbs up for James Toback's Two Girls and a Guy with a superb performance by Robert Downey Jr. as a classic two-timer. Two thumbs down for Sliding Doors with Gwyneth Paltrow experiencing alternative outcomes to her own life. 
And finally, two thumbs up, way up on Henry Jaglum's Deja Vu. Adults talking about love. So Deja Vu is a wonderful love story, and we both liked He Got Game also. You got it. Remember, you can hear our reviews on the web at siskel-eber.com. And next week, we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Les Miserables, Victor Hugo's epic tale of love and injustice, starring Liam Neeson, Uma Thurman, and Jeffrey Rush. Jean Valjean is a thief. He attempted to escape four times. He must be exposed and punished. And also Wild with Stephen Fry in the title role of the great playwright who scandalized a nation. I congratulate you on the great success of your performance, which persuades me that you think almost as highly of this play as I do myself. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Reduced fat, skippy peanut butter. Same great peanut taste. And now even easier to spread. Reduced fat, skippy. Blast your taste buds with the butterlicious taste of Blasto Butter. The ultimate movie theater microwave popcorn. New from Jolly Time Popcorn. Ambisol Cold Sore Therapy, the only one with vitamin E and aloe, starts to relieve pain instantly. Ambisol Cold Sore Therapy. Put it on, the pain is gone. Use as directed. If you're a homeowner looking to consolidate bills, call First Plus. You'll get an answer on your loan before you hang up. Call 1-800-510-PLUS.